Alrighty. Um, I don't, I don't know what episode we're on, but today I'm joined by Professor Dean Tantella out of uh, UC Davis, University of California, Davis, who is a mm, definitely a more computational chemist, but really interested in, uh, you know, physical, organic, theoretical chemistry, kind of understanding mechanisms for like total synthesis type problems. I, I believe. Uh, hopefully, there's a correct description, an accurate one, but one with many hobbies. Um, but I originally grew up uh, south of Boston from Quincy, Massachusetts. I kind of want to pick your brain about that a little bit because I also come from the Northeast, the um, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, but Quincy, um, kind of a um, underrated area, I feel like, because of one of the suburbs of Boston, you kind of get that Boston experience, but you don't have to live the city life. So um, how um, – you know, what were some of your hobbies coming out of uh, Quincy? And uh, just tell us a little bit about, you know, you growing up because I know you have a, also a lot of pictures on your your uh, your your page. So it was kind of a delight to, to see all those older pictures. So, yeah, yeah. as a first of all, as a well, thanks for having me here. Um, but I must say, as a Northeasterner, you should know that it's pronounced Quincy like there's a Z in it. <laughs> Rather than Quincy. that's the Boston accent. Do you do you maintain your Boston accent out there in California? You know, uh, it's it's mostly gone except when I talk to my parents on the phone. Um, and <laughs> like usually back. once a semester, it, yeah, it sneaks out during class, and the students are very confused. I'm usually yeah. accused of being Canadian because apparently I say out like a Canadian, which is ironic because I'm a quarter French Canadian, but. I I had never gone to Canada until I was, you know, well into my 30s. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I grew up in Quincy, um, which which I don't know if you know is actually uh, where uh, R. B. Woodward grew up, and we went both went to Quincy wow, High okay. School. But no one in Quincy apparently uh, knows that. <laughs> Although I did a report on him in high school. Oh, you're. I had no, of what total synthesis uh, was at the time. Yeah. That is that is actually so. Really fascinating. I mean, that's a really fun fact. Um, I guess for those who don't know, R.B. Yeah. Woodward is, uh, I mean, top. I mean, top three f famous synthetic organic chemists of all time. I mean, he's just that prominent. I mean, I don't really think that's a f unfair statement. Um, just a genius in total. Yeah, a lot of people. That is really cool. The, the, the greatest total synthesis chemist of all time. Although people debate those things, of course. Yeah, right. He's definitely uh, legendary. Um, was he the one that yeah, he has so, a, does he have uh, a Nobel Prize? Does he have a Nobel Prize? Okay. He has a Nobel Prize. A lot of people think he should have three. Uh, so he has okay. one uh, for uh, synthesis. Um, he doesn't have one for the Woodward-Hoffman rules for pericyclic reactions. Okay. Um, but uh, he, he almost certainly would have, except he had passed away about the time when yeah. that one was given and they don't give Nobel prizes posthumously. And he also, uh, was arguably the first person who figured out the structure of ferrocene. And there was a Nobel prize given for that, mm. which he didn't get. And I believe he was so angry about that, that he took out a full page ad in a newspaper saying he should have got one, <laughs> <That is wild. laughs> but it's an interesting history there. So, um, he was, yeah. he is an interesting character as I understand. So, was real quick. Was he the one that introduced yeah. like the idea of retro synthetic analysis? Was that him, or am I thinking of someone else? That was Corey. That was EJ Corey. Okay, uh, EJ Corey. Uh, who okay. really kind right. of formalized that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, work. Mm -hmm. How did you? You wrote. Yeah. You, you wrote a book report in high school about R. B. Woodward. That <laughs> is that. I think that's really nerdy. <laughs> I don't know a chemist. Like, yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I, I have it. I have it somewhere. Yeah. Um, so it really was, awesome. there was a, a, I forget which teacher, but, uh, who suggested I do a report on him. Um, and I looked him up and I remember going to the local library and mostly looking at uh, newspaper articles about him because he went to mm. MIT when he was 17 or something ridiculous like that. And, um, it was a real kind of prodigy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I did a report on him and, uh, but I really, you know, I had no concept of what organic chemistry was at the time. And uh, who does? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's good. looking back on it, I, kind of funny. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but, and then later yeah. on, as you probably know, I worked. I was a postdoc with Roald Hoffman. So 
was yeah. strangely connected to Woodward and Hoffman over my life. Well, I was I was yeah. I was talking to yeah, uh, my lab mate yesterday, and I was like, it's crazy how the same names just keep popping up over and over again. Everyone's like, you know, your EJ Corey, your mm-hmm. Casey Nicolaus, your Woodwards. Like, it's just always the same names. Everyone, everyone's always like connected to them somehow. So it's just it's just kind of funny how it works that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, but yeah, I derail. Yeah. Yeah, my I wanted to definitely named. Uh, I was going to say my PhD advisor was a, a student with Woodward, <laughs> so yeah, uh, mm-hmm. they're all connected. It's a, it's a surprisingly yeah. small world. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I derail. I definitely want to talk about Qu- uh, Quincy, <laughs> Massachusetts, a little bit, and like uh, just hear yes, your kind uh, of your general you. background. <laughs> yeah, you know, as a kid, I was. Uh, I was a total nerd before it was cool to be a nerd. Um, I was uh, I was super stressed out about everything. Uh, I and all that stress I put on myself. You know, I was the kind of the I was the straight A student type, but because I uh, kind of forced myself into it, uh, I, I was always worried about about not uh, kind of living up to that for some reason. I, I don't have any idea why. Um, and I didn't, you know, didn't have a lot of hobbies. I was too busy studying. <laughs> I was really into Star Fair Wars, enough. though, as I still am. <laughs> I was born in uh, 1973, which is a perfect Star Wars age. Um, and then, you know, it wasn't until really high school that I, I got a group of friends and went out and did a lot more things like, you know, playing sports and things like that. So, um, you know, there was a lot of snow in, in the Boston area, so I enjoyed that. Uh, remember the famous blizzard nothing. of 78 where uh yeah oh man you know, there's nothing kind of there's nothing uh, yeah. better though than uh like when it's really cold out super snowy and you have like a like hot chocolate you know you're like playing out in the snow and like you come home yeah. to a nice fire with some hot chocolate yep. so i understand that i actually also saw the video of um i briefly saw clips of you were talking to i guess an older an older student at this point but you're talking about uh, movies <laughs> Um, you're talking about Star yes. Wars, so yeah. I, I mm-hmm. thought that was really that was really interesting. Um, I don't know how how deep yeah, into the lore you are still. <laughs> oh, we can go down that rabbit hole if you yeah, want. I, I got I got some things. <laughs> I I'll, I have opinions on everything. I, I still follow it all. I'm a you know a big yeah. fan of uh, when the Mandalorian came out. That was awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the most recent season was okay <laughs> but i watch i watch I all it was the shows fun. yeah i have yeah. not watched andor yeah. yet uh but oh you should just, it's really good i've Darker. also i've heard so that's what I, I probably should go ahead and watch it um yeah i mean i have a lot of opinions about uh star wars too i still would like them to make a i need to, i want to see like an origin of the sith kind of movie like if it was some sort of horror movie i think that'd be really mm-hmm. really cool um, I don't know how they do mm, that, but mm-hmm. I really want to. I really want to see that. Um, well, there is a rumor anything... that they are going to make a movie, sort of about the origins of the Force. So, uh, okay, maybe that'll be in there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Hopefully. Um, but I, you know, the 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 seven, eight, and nine episodes. You know, they are what they are at this point. So I'm looking. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they're coming out with a. 10 11 12 like i don't know if there's if there's talks of that i have no idea but for what it's worth i like i like the mandalorian i like uh their their um oh man i liked i liked han solo i thought that was a fun movie and i also and i'm forgetting the name of the movie it's now it's underrated the one that, i agree the one that rogue precedes one. uh yeah rogue one yep yeah, exactly that one is also fantastic <laughs> That's that's the best movie in in uh, in recent times, definitely. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, a lot of Star Wars content is coming. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know what I don't know what new content is coming out other than like I, I know Soka Tan is coming out soon. That's the only one I know. It's like the next one that's coming out. Yep, I'm not really familiar with one. any other content. Yep. I look forward to that because I did like her in uh, the. Was she in Mandalorian? Yeah, she was in, or no, she was in Boba Fett, I think. Yeah, it was maybe mostly both. In, uh, Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you like the Book of Boba Fett? The Mandalorian I didn't really like part it. of that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really like the. It was just, uh, I, loved, 
I don't know how you feel about that. I like the part of it that was really more episodes of The Mandalorian. <laughs> right. It was like Mandalorian in like season like two and a half. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I, I don't know. I don't know. This will be the last thing I talk about with Star Wars, but like at least for this, but it's like why <laughs> it – I don't know why they they had they had a, such a great opportunity to like go into like Boba Fett after um, episode I guess would have been six right like and they just didn't like I really like the mm-hmm. episode where he was he was with the, uh, the I think they're called the Sand People I don't know they were on they were on that I'm forgetting the planet yep. now but that episode where he was like brought up with the mm-hmm. Sand People oh, that was really cool but then they like mm-hmm. I don't know they just had a really or tattooing that's what it's called so. I don't know. They they really had an opportunity to like yep. explore Boba Fett and like I don't know. They just kind of made it Mandalorian season two and a half, really. So anyway, yeah. All I'll that's say all I'll say is about that. that. Uh, Boba Fett was a lot cooler when you when you knew less about him. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And it seems to me that like the Mandalorian is what everyone thought Boba Fett was. If that makes sense, like that that yes. gunslinger. Yep, I um, agree with you. So, but then the Mandalorian came out and it was like, well, this is literally Boba Fett. So I, I don't know. It is what it is. Neither here nor there. <laughs> um, but so, all right. So coming out of high school, then uh, you did, um, you did a, your AB at Harvard. Uh, but I'm kind of curious to know, uh, you know, your, if you had any general interest in the STEM fields, like coming up um, and how that ultimately transpired to like, in, in the chemistry. Uh, yeah. So I actually had a, um, I had an organic chemistry class in high school, which is remarkable looking back on it. Um, mm. at, I think it was my senior year of high school. Actually, it was mostly nomenclature, which I hate uh, now, but, uh, <laughs> and we did some experiments, which I also don't like. Uh, but I somehow uh, saw that organic chemistry was something different, um, and so when I when I went off to undergrad, I think I knew um, that organic chemistry was something I might be interested in. So I was debating at the time if whether or not I should be a physics major or a chemistry major, uh, and I definitely made the right choice because I'm not very good at math, even though now I'm a, <laughs> technically a quantum chemist in a sense, but. The computers do all the math for me, so that's that's okay. Um, it... Yeah, so uh, I thought I was I, I thought I was probably going to be a chemistry major uh, when I got there, and I uh, you know I took Gen Chem and I didn't didn't like it, <laughs> um, and it's a tough yeah, subject. I did okay in it, not that great, but I almost didn't. Yeah, I almost didn't get into the uh, the. Uh, sort of, there were two series. Kind of, it was kind of like a majors organic, and then a uh, kind of a sort of more focused on kind of biomedical organic. And I wanted to get into the majors organic. And when the grades came out for Gen Chem, I hadn't quite made the grade to get into the majors organic. And I thought, oh, oh well. And but then I learned the power of undergrads. <laughs> Apparently, a huge number of undergrads in the uh, in the Gen Chem class. I'd like gone and protested uh, and then suddenly the grades were changed and my grade went up by half a grade and I get into the other class and what had happened, uh, which I now appreciate as, as being on the other side as a faculty member, is that the professor had had uh, made a promise earlier in the semester about how the grades would be assigned and then didn't stick to the promise um, and, and that caused a big problem and um and uh then they had they had to rectify that and so the grades were changed. Hmm. What do you got to love uh democracy right there? Democracy is finest. Um <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's really uh that's really did, now did you during your time at Harvard did you do like any like a sort of like undergraduate research or um anything like of that nature? Uh, yeah, so it, my undergrad research experience wasn't wasn't that great. Um, so, so first, I uh, I it was after my sophomore year, I went and talked to an undergrad advisor and expressed some interest in doing some research. 
and they told me, oh, you know, you know, sophomores, you know, don't get into research. Um, and I took them at their word. And, and then I, and I uh, went and, yeah, I went and got a job at the science library on campus over the summer. And when I was there over the summer, uh, sophomores kept coming in telling me about their lab experience. <laughs> So that's what one of those people like if you told me something, I just assumed it was, assumed it was right, mm. you know. And then, uh, it's about, and then, so at the time, I when I figured out that was wrong, I kind of went scrambling to try to find a lab, and I didn't find one. Um, so then, ultimately, I ended up uh, joining uh, a lab at a Harvard Med School uh, that was run by a guy named uh, Jim Hogel. He he mm. did mostly. Uh, uh, crystallography on poliovirus coat proteins, uh, which you may you get these structures of these super uh, complex um, polioviruses that had super high symmetry. They were they're were really cool to look at. Um, but when I started there, I was I found myself um, in front of like a sterile hood, um, transferring cells and counting cells in a microscope, which was the most mind numbing thing I'd ever done, um, and. Uh, I didn't like that, and, and he actually took me on to do synthesis for him, which was crazy because I was not, I didn't have a lot of synthetic experience, um, but he didn't have a, he didn't have a fume hood, so, so he had me counting cells while he waited to find a fume hood somewhere, and then he got access to a fume hood in the lab of Chris Walsh, who you might have heard of, uh, he passed away not that long ago, he's a famous natural products uh, chemist. Um, okay. among other things. And so I, I got to uh, borrow a fume hood in his lab. He was also at the Harvard Med at the time. Um, and I, and one of Chris's, Chris Walsh's postdocs was put in charge of making sure I didn't make a mess out of things. And so I went in there and, um, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was, I remember one reaction, I was trying to reduce a, an aromatic nitro group to an amine, something like that. But I, but I was, I had a procedure that I found in an old German paper and I sat down with a German English chemistry dictionary trying to translate the procedure. And I just like worried, like, did it say, you know, add sulfuric acid or did it say whatever you do, don't add sulfuric acid? Yeah, I really know. And, <laughs> um, and it, it was like a tin reduction. It was like, oh, it was all this nasty stuff. Oh, and I was really kind of, I didn't, re I didn't really have any guidance. And I remember, uh, I think I was putting like, I put chloroform in, the wrong kind of bottle. I came back the next day and it had dissolved in the fume hood. Yeah, I was, it was pretty clear I was not destined for synthetic work, <laughs> but I do mm -hmm. remember giving a presentation on total synthesis and, and retrosynthetic analysis to the, to their uh, group. That was a lot of fun. Um, so at that point I really kind of understood that, uh, synthesis was, was not my thing, but I loved organic chemistry. Uh, so I was kind of torn. I also took a, um, I guess it was in my senior year, uh, I, I took a, an organometallics class taught by Eric Jacobson that was really awesome. Oh, man. And I had previously taken a, a physical organic class taught by Peter Chen that was also awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew I, I really loved chemistry. And, and also, I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I thought I'd go to grad school. <laughs> so I applied to grad schools um, and, you know, and thought I would see what happened. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's a, it's kind of a good segue into your graduate school experience. Cause I feel like, I, I feel like many, many graduate students can attest. So like sometimes if like they get the, they're close to like finishing their chemistry degree, they don't necessarily know what they want to do yet, but they know they don't want to go into industry. So graduate school is probably the next natural right. step. I mean, that's what I've, I've talked to people about it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of what happened with me, honestly. Uh, but mm -hmm. so you did your, but you, then you did your, um, uh, your graduate degree at UCLA with Ken Houck, professor Ken Houck, who is mm -hmm. a, you know, look, I'm not in the computational chemistry world necessarily. I'm kind of a novice when it comes to that kind of stuff, but I know he's very, um, well known for computationally, uh, chemistry, especially for like biochemistry type, uh, I would say. It seems like at least I, every time yeah, I see I, papers, he, I, I see a yeah, lot of like biochemistry type yeah. medicinal stuff. But I, I don't know. That's kind of how I would describe him. But yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a bit about about Hulk, But I, let me tell you first that something really important happened the summer before I went to grad school. So yeah, I decided yeah. to hang around in, in Boston, and I um, 
I got a, a TA position at the Harvard Summer School uh, where they were teaching organic chemistry. And I thought I was going to be put in charge of a, a lab section. But somehow, through no fault of my own, I, I was put in charge of a discussion section for an organic chem class. And mm. um, and I was, uh, you know, I, up until that point in my life, I was pretty much terrified of public speaking. <laughs> and uh, But I was thrown in front of you know, undergrads taking organic chem and I, and I was, you know, supposed to talk about organic chemistry and somehow I wasn't scared and I loved it. I, so I discovered through that summer that I really liked teaching about organic chemistry and it wasn't so terrifying if it was something I really uh, enjoyed talking about. And that really, uh, focused my attention on, on grad school that, uh, I, I, that's when I felt like I had a purpose <laughs> to go to grad school. They're like, hey. oh, well, I, I think I want to be a teacher, an organic chemistry teacher. So no matter how much I hate the research I do, I could I could go be a teacher afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah. And so also I had applied, I had applied to a, a bunch of grad schools in the Northeast and in California. And uh, I didn't get into any in the Northeast. <laughs> so most places I applied to rejected me. And then I, I got into UCLA and I got into... Um, I get into Stanford and not Berkeley. And so I had this awkward like visitation uh, where I went and visited Stanford and, and all the people there said, okay, well, yeah, yeah, I'll see you at Berkeley. I'm like, not me. It's <laughs> 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 uh, like everyone. Got Tough one. Uh, and then people, people ask me on paper, why did I go to UCLA instead of Stanford? And I said, well, you know, when I, when I visited Stanford, the group I was interested in had like 40 people in it and it seemed like I would just would get lost there. And at UCLA, the groups were smaller. I felt like I would get more individual attention and it right. just seemed a lot more welcoming. And I just kind of trusted my gut feeling about the environment. Um, and it was the right thing. So when I went to UCLA, actually, I first joined a synthetic organometallic group. Uh, it was run by a guy named Craig Merlick. Um, and cause I, I didn't know anything about theoretical chemistry at the time. Uh, and I proceeded to just make a mess out of his lab for a year. <laughs> and uh, and so, and I was pretty unhappy doing the research I was doing. And then I got really lucky that a, a, a friend of my best friend at the time, uh, you know, I was talking to him about how unhappy I was and how I th thought I would just, I'll suck it up for five years, be unhappy, and then I'll go teach because you really kind of need a PhD if you want to teach organic chemistry. Um, he said, you know, have yeah. you ever thought about computational chemistry? Because he had some experience in that when he was an undergrad. And I said, no. <laughs> and, and I looked into it. And it was just super lucky that Ken Houck was, he was on my floor <laughs> in my building. Um, mm. And he just happens to be, most people would consider him the best computational organic chemist in the world. <laughs> So I, I, I thought about it and I decided I was going to change groups. So I changed groups after the first year. And I remember distinctly going into Houck's office and, um, you know, I was, I looked far worse than I do now. I was completely unshaven. I'm mostly unshaven now, but still I looked scruffier. I had a baseball <laughs> cap on and I, and I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to switch into your group. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to have to check you out. <laughs> and he sent me away. <laughs> and then he. And he, he looked into me and, and I had done well in classes and things and he gave me a chance. Uh, and, and that changed everything because then I discovered research that I really liked. I'd always loved, you know, synthesis on paper and I loved mechanism. And suddenly I was able to sort of pursue the things I really loved doing without the things I hated doing, like rotovapping. And I was always very insecure in the lab. I always was afraid about breaking things and hurting myself. And yeah, yeah. those that's exactly the way to break things and hurt yourself if you're if you're right. not confident in what you're doing. So um so it was those really real concerns. You know, just luck. Yeah. That I, I was able to find something that worked for me and and it uh yeah, totally changed my perspective. So it was probably really my second, third, really even third year of grad school that I started thinking about oh, I think I want a job where I both teach and do research because now there's research that I think I want to do. And yeah. that's really when I finally discovered the, the kind of job I thought I wanted. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's crazy how that worked out too, because you know, it, just that summer before you thought about going to graduate school, like you weren't supposed to be yeah, yeah. there, if that makes sense. And then getting to grad school, yeah, yeah. like getting to grad school, you were in an organometallic synthetic group and you were, were you necessarily supposed to, you know, get this information about King House group? So it's just kind of really, I mean, I, I swear a lot of chemists have these moments where it's like, it just lines up and, you know, you just got to run with it. Um, that's really, yeah, that's exactly really cool. That. I mean, I, I give these career talks once in a while and, and what is, what is my message, right? It's not like plan everything out, <laughs> you know, no. some people are really good planners and, and I used to think I was a good planner, but the, the way that I got where I am today is not at all the result of any good planning. It's the result of a series of happy accidents <laughs> that I was able to take advantage of. Right. So I guess my right. advice is just keep your eyes open for, uh, things that you bump into and, uh, you know, you might not have considered might work for you and see if they do. And if they do, then, yeah. then jump on board and take advantage. Right. I definitely uh, think that, you know, good things happen to good people. So as long as you're being a good person all the time, you know, opportunities will arise uh, for sure. I would um, agree with you. My other advice would be try to be a good person. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You do those, you do those things and, you know, good things will, will, will happen to you. Um, yeah, I think, well, first of all, how was the switch though from, you know, Boston, the Boston area, Northeast area to California? I mean, yeah. obviously like, you know, how was that yeah. change and how do you, you know, I, I'm going to go, you know, I assume, you know, coming from, uh, the Northeast, you know, family is definitely an important thing. So, you know, how, how did your family feel about, you know, moving all the way across the you know, United States and yeah, uh, my, my mom was against it. <laughs> yeah. But, so it, it helped that I didn't get into any schools in, in the Northeast. So the, uh, fair enough. It wasn't like, uh, you know, we could make an argument that I should go to the local school I get into. <laughs> so, um, but for me, it was, it was pretty terrifying. I was always very much a, a homebody. I had, you know, I, you know, I grew up in Quincy and then I, I was an undergrad in Boston, which was not very far. And for the first two years of college, I was still, bringing my laundry home on the subway, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to my parents' house. And, um, so it, it, it was quite a culture shock. I had never lived in that, lived that far from home. Um, but it was the best thing I ever did because it forced me to figure out how to take care of myself and live on my own and, and experience somewhere different. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was super hard for me given my personality and everything but it it uh it was probably the most significant uh certainly the most significant move in my life in that it really mm -hmm. sort of opened my mind up and uh and forced me to take more responsibility for myself and figure out how to do things independently yeah mm -hmm. what were some of like the mm -hmm. what were some of the things I in the still, northeast I you missed about distinctly, uh, oh um yeah, well, I I missed uh, good pizza. <laughs> That's the main thing. <laughs> um, that is so true. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, I miss I miss the seasons. Uh, you right. know, L L.A. doesn't didn't have seasons. <laughs> um, those those are kind of the main things. Um, I would yeah. say that you know you kind of in L.A. especially California in general, but. LA especially you really lose track of time because every day looks the same um, right I still remember one time it it went over 200 days without any rain and then I was driving down a road and then that, it, you know the day I, it finally rained and then I was driving down the same road I drove down every day and I'm like oh yeah there's a mountain down there I forgot about it because it, you know there's this haze that settles in when it doesn't rain and um, yeah. you just kind of lose track of 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 you know, sort of where you are in your life because all the days mm -hmm. kind of blend together. So it's hard to mark time. That, that was what were some of the things you did? Yeah. What were some of the things you did as like a, as a graduate student? Like that's, I mean, obviously like, you know, we have our chemistry to do, um, mm -hmm. but like, what were some of the, like your kind of favorite moments like outside of the, um, chemistry? Yeah. Outside of chemistry. Um, so I, every week I, I would play, uh, like pick up basketball with, 
mostly other guys from from the chemistry department, including some faculty. And I'm short. I'm only I'm five six. If you round me up, <laughs> and uh, my strength in basketball is that uh, I have a very low center of gravity, <laughs> so uh, sure. which has limited utility. Uh, but that was that was tons of fun. Um, they really blow off steam. There was a little court like right across from the chemistry building. Uh, so I used to look forward to that. Um, also, I used to go see uh, bad movies at this little art house theater that uh, it would, they would play really old bad movies. Like if you'd know like the, the old parody uh, Hardware Wars was like the original parody of Star Wars. Like they would play that on a real screen. And um, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that once in a double feature with a movie called uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor, Queen of Outer Space, which was a hilarious movie from like, I don't know, the fifties or something just just crazy yeah. bad movies like that um and was was the purpose yeah. of the movie theater to to show bad movies like that was literally the purpose of it or yeah as far as i could tell yeah <laughs> that's yeah. really cool uh there's something to be said about like bad movies like like just having some popcorn drinking a soda not having to think too hard it's just there is something to be said about that. There definitely yeah, is a place about, for it. Like uh, Mystery Science Theater, it, it was very much like that live before that existed. <laughs> uh -huh. So at, at UCLA, then uh, what you know, what were some of your responsibilities, like uh, research-wise? Like what 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 did you um, do uh, with Professor Halk? Yeah. So uh, so Halk uh, really, you know, he worked on everything. <laughs> so from biological things to synthetic things. Uh, he even had a couple of fume hoods. He had some people doing experiments. Um, so when he was a mm -hmm. grad student, he was doing uh, synthetic work. So his his PhD was on experimental tests of the Woodward Hoffman rules back in the day. Um, so we always kept a couple people doing experiments. I didn't, I didn't do any. Um, and so he even did some like materials things on the computational side, super molecular things. So uh, he was, really into a lot of different things. So when I when I worked with him, uh, I did some calculations on organometallic chemistry, some synthetic organic reactions, um, and uh, a fair amount of biological things. So it was kind of at the, the at the time, uh, nitric oxide chemistry was really big. So I did a little bit on nitric oxide chemistry and biology, um, a little bit on the enzymes that um, are involved in how nitric oxide is produced. And then mm. also it was the tail end of uh, the catalytic antibody year. So there was this time when catalytic antibodies were all the rage. You were going to be able to get a, a, a tailor-made enzyme for whatever you wanted by using this catalytic antibody technology, and it never really panned out. But um, So I was there kind of at the end of that time where we were trying to understand how catalytic antibodies work. So I did a, a good number of calculations related to that. Um, so... Yeah, so my stuff kind of touched on a bunch of different areas uh, as well, from biological things to traditional organic reactions, so um, to organometallic things. My my first, the first time I I felt like I actually discovered something <laughs> was uh, I was looking at a for a collaborator. I was looking at a reaction where nucleophiles were adding to alpha lactams, so three membered ring lactams, mm -hmm. and I discovered that when you know an alpha lactam can open on its own to an acyclic uh th three membered uh, th uh three atom system and when when i found the transition state for that the the carbonyl of the lactam when the ring was opening kept bending down out of the plane of the other three atoms and i didn't understand why it should and then i figured out why <laughs> and it and it has to do with the pi uh, star orbital of the carbonyl wanting to overlap with the electrons in the breaking bond. Um, it's very much like uh, something called the the um, Depew Woodward Hoffman um, rule. When you open a cyclopropane, it prefers to open anti to a halogen that's going to leave. For example, um, mm. so it's an orbital. It's an orbital effect. And it was this was the first time I had ever sort of figured out why on my own, <laughs> and and that's when I felt like I was doing the right thing. Like I was so excited about this. It was just such a small thing, and 
you know, and I like I made a big deal out of it in the draft of the paper and no one no one else in the world probably cared about it. But but that's when I remember like I finally like discovered something. That's when I knew what it was like to discover something. <laughs> well, that's something to be said about, you know, making that initial discovery, right? Because then it sets you on this trajectory of like, oh, I actually can do it, you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah it definitely exactly. is a really definitely a, a fun moment that you'll keep. Um, yeah, I think mm-hmm. um, I'm kind of curious to know what kind of uh, – uh, what kind of theory did you guys did you use back um, at the time? Because I don't I don't I don't remember yeah, when so, DFT was like a full mm-hmm. thing. I don't know I don't know when that was like invented. I guess. Yeah. So yeah. So I got my PhD in two two thousand, um, and that was so I started in the health group. I got to UCLA in ninety five, but you know, like I said, I was a year in this um, other group. So it was the late nineties, and that's really when DFT was taken over. Um, mm-hmm. So I mostly did DFT. Um, mostly, if you're a DFT person or you read any DFT papers, we were mostly using B3 lip, um, which is what everyone used at the time until people started complaining about it and using other things. Um, and, and it still works pretty well for, for so many organic things. Um, that B3 lip with small basis sets was what we were doing. Uh, we were also using MP2, which was kind of the go-to thing for uh, reliable calculations on organic molecules at the time um so it was right right at i was there kind of right at the turning point where dft was about to just dominate everything yeah yeah Yeah, okay yeah that's really uh that's really that's really cool um just on i actually have a um a couple of well i I don't know if you're the right person to ask about this but i'm gonna ask it anyway but um i was going over um a couple of questions yesterday with our computational um, um, expert, and we were talking about like bifurcation. And so I don't, um, cause you, and you know, and cause you kind of do natural product, uh, carbocation cyclization types of, so you might be the right person to ask about this then. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, understanding what bifurcation is. And I don't know if I, you're able I am to- I like, a bifurcation ex- person, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I, I could just start with that. Like, what is what is bifurcation? Yep. And let's, let's just start there. We'll, we'll go. I'll just start there. Yeah. So I assume you're talking about what I would call a post-transition state bifurcation. Um, yes. Yeah. So that, that, that yeah. So what that means is, uh, so normally, you know, when you're taught about reactions, you learn that you have a reactant that goes to a transition state, and as you fall down from the transition state, um, the the steepest descent pathway down leads to another minimum, the product, another low point on a potential energy surface, right? Um, but sometimes, uh, actually, when that, when you go down the hill from the transition state, that pathway can split into uh, and lead to two different products, two different minima, um, and without stopping at any intervening intermediate. Okay, that's called a post-transition state bifurcation. Um, so that that's what it means. So one transition state can lead directly to two products uh, by path, pathways that start the same pathway and it splits in two, but it's it's uh, monotonically a monotonic de- decrease in energy down to the products. So it's continuously downhill mm-hmm. to both products. And so what happens is you hit. So when you when you leave the region of the transition state, you're locally in. Uh, a valley, right? There are walls on either side of you, right? You're taking the lowest energy path down from the transition state. But at some point, you hit a point where those walls go away, and then you're, there's a ridge, and you can fall off the ridge on either side to one of the two products. So there's a point called mm. a valley ridge inflection point, right? Which is another marker of a, of a post-transition state bifurcation. So that, that's what it means. One transition state leads to two products. Okay. And technically, is that would that be a like a stationary point then, or like could you like define it on like a, uh, the valley ridge a grid? In, yeah, yeah. The valley ridge inflection point is not a stationary point, and they're really hard to actually locate. Um, and usually, you don't even need to locate them. Um, there are other ways to characterize bifurcations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, if let's say in a, in a hypothetical um, scenario, the uh, products underwent like a dynamic equilibrium, like let's say there's yes. two points, then would bifurcation be a part of that equilibrium or is it something else like entirely? Yeah, so so if if you were super careful and you came down from that transition state, right, 
you and you took the pathway down and you went through the valley ridge inflection point and you stayed mm. on the ridge instead you didn't fall off to the two products what you would end up at is the transition state that interconverts the two products okay um okay. so if so if the two products are rapidly interconverting on their own, then it doesn't matter how they were formed. It doesn't matter they were formed from a bifurcation or not. All you would see is the thermodynamic ratio resulting from those two products equilibrating. So mm -hmm. I would say it was cool that they were formed from a bifurcation, but it would, it would be irrelevant to your experimental result if they were rapidly interconverting anyway. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, I guess one, one last what's thing more, I have about that is like... What's more interesting is, is, okay. is when there's a bifurcation that leads to two products uh, that are connected by a transition state that's too high. So you're trapping the ratio of products that you get from the bifurcation. Yeah, so that's a, that's a kinetically controlled, that's a kinetic ratio of products where both products came from the same transition state. So that's, that to me is much more interesting. Okay, that is that is really cool. I guess what would be what would be kind of like a an example of that. I don't know if it if that's too difficult to explain, but yeah. So uh, yeah, so there are actually a lot of examples now. So we've actually written a review on this. Hulk has a an earlier review. Uh, there, so there are. Um, let me let me think of a of a of an example. So there there are examples in. In natural products biosynthesis, there are mm. examples in organometallic chemistry, um, synthetic organic chemistry. So, my my favorite example at the moment from our research involves uh, a reaction where um, you have a uh, you have you make a uh, metal carbene. So you have a diazo compound and dirhodium tet tetraacetate, and so you make a rhodium carbene, and mm -hmm. that rhodium carbene. Uh, you you want that rhodium carbene to do a CH insertion uh, to make a uh, beta lactone, so to insert a, a couple atoms okay. away, so that you make a four membered ring lactone, right? Um, and so we found that uh, the transition state for for that CH insertion, okay, to make the beta lactone is followed by a bifurcation, a and one side of that bifurcation leads to the beta lactone. But the other side of that bifurcation leads to fragmentation to a ketone and a ketene. So imagine mm. cutting the beta lactone in half in ketone and ketene. So when yep. you go over that transition state, you could go, either go to the product you want or you could go to these fragments that are not useful to you. Um, and the ratio of products you get is, is controlled by momentum when you go over the transition state or what's called a non-statistical dynamic effect. So that one I like because I, I like to discuss that one with my synthetic friends because what it's telling you is that how much product, desired product you get versus unwanted side product is the result of a post transition state bifurcation, <laughs> right? And so hmm. if you want to control that ratio, you have to understand something about the bifurcation. That is really cool. And, uh, I, I was talking to my uh, PI a, a couple of weeks ago. I, I guess now at this point, we, uh, he was he brought up he mentioned uh, something from Dan Singleton about the idea of like momentum and yes. like how that. Yep. Mm -hmm. like, I was like, I was like, my mind was blown because I never even heard of it. I never really like thought about it before. Like the idea of yeah, yeah. momentum in a let's say chemical reaction or transition state. Like, I was like, okay, it, it kind of makes yes. de sense in principle, but I never like really thought it that way. Um, yeah, so so Singleton is one of one of my uh, favorite chemists. He's also a, a super nice guy. He's also he's also very funny. Um, yeah. So uh, and so th this I the momentum idea really was brought to the organic world. It was out there in the PCHEM world, um, but really applied to really small molecules. But it was really brought to the organic world by Barry Carpenter um, mm. years ago. Um, and uh, Singleton has really shown its relevance in so many uh, contexts related to uh, sort of classic organic and synthetic organic reactions. Um, and then we've been involved in that and, and Hulk has been involved in that and, and others. Um, but the idea is basically that, um, you know, the, the nuclei have mo momenta when you go over a transition state, right? They're moving a certain way. And 
usually for your, you know, if you go over one transition state that, and at least on one product, that doesn't matter. It's not going to change anything. So it's always mm -hmm. happening, right? And 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 so, uh, you know, the reaction is what's called statistical. <laughs> so it's a there's always dynamics of the molecule. The atoms are always wiggling around, um, but it fits to so-called statistical models. Where, where the to my mind, the classic case there's sort of two classic cases, but the one we're talking about right now with the bifurcation, that momentum is everything, really, because if you imagine. Imagine that you were tumbling down that hill from the transition state, right? And you hit the valley ridge inflection point. So you hit that ridge and you're going to fall off one way or the other. But what's going to determine which way you fall off? It's going to be how you're wiggling, you know, how your yeah, atoms yeah. are moving. The momentum the molecule has, it's either going to, if you're, if you're happen to be leaning towards the right, you're going to fall off to the right. If you happen to be moving towards the left, you're going to fall off to the left. So that's really going to be controlled by the momentum. Um, that's that's gonna really dominate the product ratio. So you can't ignore it in a that case is... like that. Usually it's always there, but usually you can ignore it comfortably, <laughs> right? So we're, we're, yeah. as organic chemists, we're always you know, we're generally comfortable. We write a reaction coordinate and we think of the reactants smoothly morphing to the transition state and the products. But of course, that's not what it's like. There's energy in the vibrational modes. Everything is wiggling and jiggling the whole time. But we. But we don't care because it doesn't change anything. But sometimes it changes things, mm. and and that's that that's uh, you know essential when you're dealing with a reaction with with a bifurcation. <laughs> yeah, that is a yeah. That's that's really fascinating because yeah. For those for those who may not as familiar with chemistry, I mean, many reactions you know you, you do they usually have one outcome. <laughs> many of them do. They have one outcome. Uh, but when you start talking about you know diastereo selectivity or at least things where i mean like you said like byproducts are then these issues they're not necessarily issues but like just things to consider um and this this idea of bifurcation something that um i know i'm interested in but also two of my group members were, were curious to pick your brain about too so um that's really that's really mm -hmm. cool um yeah you mentioned something something that's really of interest to me which is uh selectivity right so i'm really interested mm -hmm. in reactions where the selectivity so so you can where you you're getting two or more products where that selectivity comes from somewhere unusual <laughs> rather than yeah. just two competing transition states right there's gonna be some unusual effect that's kind of the theme of what what we're interested in mm -hmm. yeah so kind of circling back uh, a little bit too so um yeah you did your uh, phd with uh, professor ken Halk at ucla um, how was it a natural decision for you to then go into a postdoc or what were kind of the, some of the decisions mm -hmm. leading up in, to, into that? Yeah. So I was certainly under the impression at the time, which I think was correct, that if I wanted a faculty position that I needed to do a postdoc. Um, and as I mentioned, I had decided at that point that I wanted to, to both teach and do research. And so, um, I wanted to try for, uh, you know, a faculty position where I would uh, have graduate students and be able to teach. Um, and so I thought about, like, you know, where should I postdoc? <laughs> but uh, there weren't many computational organic groups around. <laughs> there are more yeah. now, but there's still not a ton, but um, there really weren't very many <laughs> at the time. And so I was thinking about options. And then, um, so actually I was... I had kind of settled on in some way about uh, uh, approaching Barry Carpenter because I really liked what he did uh, at Cornell. And I kept saying to myself, uh, yeah, if I go there, maybe I can talk to Roald Hoffman because <laughs> he sounds really cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I thought, can I, can I go to Roald Hoffman? <laughs> uh, and, and the hesitation yeah. was more that he hadn't been doing much organic chemistry at the time, you know, and, and I'd mention it to people, and I'm like, doesn't he just write plays and poetry now? <laughs> like, no, if you look at him, he's still publishing at Jack's every year. It's just not on organic things. Um, yeah. And I talked to Hulk about it, and he's like, yeah, you should, you should, yeah, contact him. And so um, I believe I sent him an email, and then in response, I got like a giant envelope full of stuff back. <laughs> at the time, he was still like doing everything in handwritten letters. So I have, you know, like so, some people show me like, oh, I got this letter from Roald. I'm like, I got 
I got reams of paper with rolls yeah. writing on it. You know, it's not. <laughs> it's far more common than you think. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and so I, he just, somehow I guess he had funding, and and he said he'd give me a position. So and then when I when I got to Cornell, uh, then I approached uh, Carpenter and asked if I could come to his group meetings as well, uh, which I did, and and ironically. Uh, Carpenter was at the time he was talking all about momentum and dynamic effects mm. and I didn't understand any of it it was all completely over my head and it wasn't until like a decade later when I was a faculty member that it became relevant to the projects I was doing and then I started to understand it and I'm like oh my goodness that's what Barry was talking about when I was a postdoc he was so far ahead of everyone else so yeah it was remarkable yeah so when you, uh, I guess when you uh, went back to then to Cornell, um, what what were you working on with mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, Professor Hoffman? Yeah, so with Ro- yeah with, with Roald, it was uh, it was kind of a fun little uh, tension that uh, he was trying to pull me towards solid state inorganic, and I was trying to pull him back towards organic, um, and. So when I got there, though, this great thing happened. He he went to this filing cabinet and he pulled out this paper that was. Um, I'm sure you're too young to know what a mimeograph is, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I don't a, know what that is. Before I was a kid, so when I was a kid in school, yeah, you know, this was before photocopying was a thing. So all our papers were mimeographed. So they would be we call them, they would be run off. There was like a crank you turned, and they. Uh, and there was this like copy paper and they were printed in like purple ink. <laughs> so, so he gave me this, this mimeographed paper and it was a paper that he said, he, he said, I tried to get this published. I think it was in the late sixties, but uh, no one would accept it. Uh, why don't you look in here and find something to do? And it was called uh, molecules that should be made. <laughs> and it was a collection of molecules that he thought would be cool. <laughs> and I looked through it and the first thing I noticed was half of the stuff in there people had done since then. And, and like everything he had predicted was right, which was amazing. Um, and so then we picked a couple of things out of there that uh, he he had dreamed up a long time ago because these were all organic things. And we did some calculations on them. And then uh, we also worked on some uh, uh, metal promoted pericyclic reactions. Um, yeah, so it was mostly just things for fun <laughs> it was it was yeah. it was really cool mm-hmm. the other so thing about, i will tell you about roll is yeah okay go ahead. go ahead i never yeah every time i ever went to him with something i was excited about chemistry wise he would it was amazing he would instantly see like what was interesting about it and get excited um even if he had never thought about it before it was out of the realm of things he had been thinking about he, he had this amazing ability to like instantly see what was interesting about it. And it was, yeah, yeah it was great. That's crazy. I mean, that some, some professors can just do that. Just envision that it's just some, it's a level. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be able to get to, but, um, <laughs> so about, yeah. So about, I guess about those, uh, chemical or molecules that should be made. Uh, what was it more? Was it more like, because you weren't just doing computational chemistry for the sake of doing computational chemistry. There must have been something about why you couldn't make those molecules, right? Like what, like so, uh-huh. how, you know what I mean? Yeah, so they were they were all uh, really theoretically interesting molecules. So molecules with unusual bonding or unusual reactivity. So we started with some molecules that they were one five hexadienes that could do cope rearrangements, but they were embedded in like ridiculously strained systems. And you mm. know, the, the questions were, you know, uh, how, how low would the barriers be? Would, um, would, you know, would they involve diradical intermediates? Um, you know, would, would, uh, boat transition states be favored over chair transition states, given the constraints, mm. things like that. So we did some work on that, and then we also um, looked at some uh, strangely delocalized carbocations. So we designed a uh, a uh, CHCHC uh, five-center four-electron delocalized carbocation. 
Um, and then we also did some things uh, that were uh, relatively small models of potential polymers that would be fluxional uh, by way mm. of pericyclic reactions, so hydrogen shifts or co arrangements that would move electrons around a polymer backbone. So things that were, you know, in principle could lead to applications, but really were for the sake of, you know, cool bonding or cool reactivity. Yeah. And then I learned when I was on my own that uh, if I'm not rolled, I can't get funding for those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's the, that's the way she goes now nowadays. Um, just on, we probably should touch on like what pericyclic reactions are just for, uh, for just for everyone. Like what you might just want to explain what that is. Yeah, so in a, in a pericyclic reaction, um, during the course of the reaction, uh, there's a rearrangement of electrons that, and that rearrangement happens cyclically. So all the electrons move around in a cycle, uh, and um, if that reaction is allowed, uh, basically that uh, cyclic delocalization of electrons is good and generally is thought to have some amount of aromaticity or aromatic character associated with it that makes it good um mm. i can go on for hours about the details of that but that's probably good enough for now <laughs> <laughs> if uh if people are more interested they used to be called yeah yeah i'll say they used no, to be ahead, called uh no no mechanism reactions uh because there there are mm. no intermediates if it's pericyclic you go yeah. directly from reactant to product just rearrange all the electrons at once but the electrons have to go around in a cycle Interesting. Um, yeah, well, well, we're going to touch on more, I guess, pericyclic reactions. I know that's kind of that's at least part of what you do now too. Um, but it's mm -hmm. interesting. You so you went you went from Quincy to UCLA back to Cornell Northeast, and now you're back as yep. a professor at UC Davis. So, um, yep. you know how how did that position open up? You know, how, you know, were you looking around at different universities and had the uh, opportunity to rise to go uh, teach? Yeah as a professor at UC Davis. Yeah, so I was I was actually on the job market for two years. So the first year I applied to uh, every um, PhD granting school that was uh, hiring an organic chemist, uh, which at the time was close to 70 places. Um, and I, I don't think there are that many places looking for organic chemists nowadays, but... Um, and I got uh, roughly 10 interviews thereabouts. Um, and I got uh, a few offers. Um, and I, I think I got three offers and I, I turned them all down, which my uh, dad could not understand. <laughs> so <laughs> my dad is a retired master plumber and he did not understand how I could turn down a job offer. <laughs> Um, and I understand that. <laughs> so first of all, I got really lucky that uh, Roll was willing to pay me for another year. Um, and and so, um, you know, I turned down one offer uh, because it was uh, they it was a small place, and they demanded that I give them an answer before I'd even gone on half my interviews. And so I'm like, well, okay, well then I guess the answer is no. Um, yeah. I turned down another place because I I would have been the the senior organic chemist in that department. <laughs> and, and that's not good, especially for a computational person who wants to collaborate with other organic chemists. So it was things like that. Um, yeah. And so the, the, the second year I, uh, I was more careful in, in ruling out places ahead of time that I, I knew I just wouldn't go to. Um, so I applied to about half as many places. I get about half as many interviews uh, and I got what I like to call one and a half offers, which is the uh, glass is half full way of describing it. So uh, I got an offer from Davis and an offer from another school. Well, I didn't get an offer from another school. I was number two uh, uh, at the other school. Um, and they tried to get a second position to make two offers. And it took them a long time to, to figure out that um, they weren't going to be allowed to make a second offer to me. Um, and, uh, mm. so I ended up with only one offer <laughs> and, and that was, that was fine. Um, and, and I think, you know, 
uh, Davis is a really good fit for me. And even if that other offer had come through, um, the other place was comparable. I don't know which one I would have taken, but in retrospect, I think Davis is a better fit for me than the other place. I'm not mentioning the other place, but... Um, and the person they hired with their number one position left after a few years anyway. <laughs> so um, they actually ended up with, well. with no one in the long run at that place, uh, which is unfortunate for them. Uh, but I will say one thing that happened because uh, I was waiting to hear if I was going to get that second offer. I kept uh, asking Davis for more time. And, you know, I had no experience negotiating or I didn't know what to do. Um and so I, I kept asking for more time and Davis kept offering me little things <laughs> like, oh, OK. So I kind of I didn't, you know, you know, I didn't get a lot, but I got a few extra things that I might not have otherwise gotten uh, because of that. Yeah. So I like to say I negotiated by accident <laughs> for a couple of small things. But, I, you know, when, you, when you're in yeah. that position, you have none of the power. You're you know, I was totally clueless as to how to negotiate and. Um, so I always, you know, I, I, when we're hiring people, I try to help them <laughs> with negotiating uh, because I remember how clueless I felt at the time. Yeah. yeah. So also I'll tell you actually, a, a actually, story. Cool. The, uh, so the, fir the first year, uh, Davis was hiring uh, and I was not interviewed. So I, I have a rejection letter from Davis that first year I was on the job market. And uh, so when I got the job at Davis, yeah, I framed it and I put it in my office. <laughs> and hey. the, the chair of that search, uh, a guy named uh, Mark Kurth, who's uh, one of my good friends now, uh, he, he came by when I got to Davis. He's such a, he's a friendly guy. He came by to say hello and to chat with me and we're chatting. And, and I'm like, hey, check this out. I reached up to my shelf and I handed it to him. <laughs> And it was a letter signed by him that re was that rejected me, <laughs> and he like turned bright red. It was it was awesome, and, and you know, we've been friends ever since. But I'll keep that letter oh, in my man, office to show that's, people that you know you can't make that what up. What happened it's, uh... was the the search committee, yeah, the search committee changed, um, and it wasn't that you know I don't blame him at all, but they what they were looking for also changed in that year, you know, and if you're not looking right. for uh, a, a computational person for your organic position, then why would you pay any attention to my application, right? If you're not thinking yeah. of that as an option. So I don't fault them for that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but you so much of I mean. it was, it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was what, you know, what, what places were looking for is a big part of it. Right. Mm, yeah. And definitely uh, when people get rejected, you gotta keep that in mind with, you know, people are looking for, um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a, that's really funny. Um, but, that's but a funny. You had to mind, up. Would, no, it's a... well, yeah, I, I want to say one thing about that though. That um, for me, being on faculty searches, the the one of the biggest turnoffs in a candidate is when I feel like they are trying to present themselves um, at, to to be what they think we are looking for, <laughs> right? I feel like mm. you need to present yourself as what you are. You need to talk about what you really want to do uh, and what you're passionate about. Don't don't present what you think we want you to do or what you think granting granting agencies want you to do. Um, because yeah. okay. you, you can tell when someone's not really not really into what they're presenting, right? So we, what we want is someone, if someone is really passionate about the research they want to do, then you usually are convinced they're going to be able to find a way to do that. They're going to find the resources to do that. That's far more important. I've seen many candidates come through where I felt like, well, they're not really into this, but they, they think they're going to be able to get funding for this. And that, that's not what you look for in a scientist. Mm. So, and that's become that's more common conducive. over the years, but it's unfortunate, I think. So, mm. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to be a little preachy there for well, a moment. We're no, I understand that because <laughs> – no, no, no. I, I – I, I hear you there because I feel like the the bar for professorships always being raised and so people are always trying to mm -hmm. um I mean that's just how and that you know it's it's just the ebbs and flows of academia I feel like in general where it's like the the bar is always set, being set higher so it's like you always got to raise the game. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget who I was talking to about this but it was just like at, at some point you also kind of lose you lose sight of the fundamentals of like, let's say the chemistry itself. Like people are so 
um, quick to think of like, oh, how am I going to get grants for this? Like, let's say whether it's like from a pharmaceutical standpoint, yeah. medicinal, or like, let's say a polymer standpoint, it's like always sustainability. So it's like they're, they're trying to think of, they're trying to go right for the applications of these things, right? Instead of just f asking fundamental questions, which yep. is kind of being lost nowadays. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, that's what it seems yeah, like to me I anyways. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And I, I yeah, I mean, it, it makes me grumpy that, um, the system has kind of gone in that direction and so many of the uh, of applications of chemistry did not come out of research started with those applications in mind it came out came out of fundamental work and so um you know so you know i made a choice a long time ago to kind of stick to what i'm really interested in and and um you know not pursue too hard things that i feel like i i don't i don't get in i don't write grants if i'm not really interested in the chemistry um sometimes yeah. i'll be involved in a collaborator's grant as as a favor if the, the chemistry still has to be interesting to me but if i'm going to put the effort into writing my own grant i really have to be excited about it um and mm -hmm. so that means that most of my funding over the years has come from nsf uh i've still never had my own nih grant um because I've had a hard time, uh, you know, figuring out how to pitch something to the NIH that was applied enough, I think, or, or maybe I, you know, maybe I'm just bad at it. I don't know. But um, NSF has been good to me because they value fundamental things. Um, yeah. So that's, I've, most, I've mostly survived on NSF funding and um, parts of other people's grants. <laughs> that's kind of how I, I've survived. Um, and I don't regret it uh, at all, but I, yeah. I do worry about the system where it's it's really encouraging people to um, to not focus on fundamental questions anymore and be driven by applications. And that uh, I don't think that's good for the future of mm -hmm. the system or or the world. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah, I think. I mean, you, and you definitely can speak to this more than I, than I can. It seems to me that, like, I mean, look, a lot of the funding agencies, you know, are like your NIHs, which it's not, you know, I'm not here to say that it's good or bad, but at the end of the day, like, pharma, like mm -hmm. big pharma and big insurance, they have a lot of they have a lot of dough, and so they're gonna want, you know, they are the ones, you know, writing the funding, writing the grants, kind of the same with the oil and gas and plastic industry, like, you know, if you want to get into that plastics and oil gas like well then you kind of have to fit that mold um i'm actually unfamiliar with like let's say the material side of it so i'm not really you know in that sort of mm -hmm. space but i don't know i don't know what the answer is to get back to more fundamental understand I, I really don't um until i guess yeah, maybe i mean to me to me uh, i would say you know there there's nothing there's nothing wrong with wanting all these applications right i mean we all want yeah, more cures of course. for diseases Right. But I, I think it's I, I think that it's um, it's short sighted. I don't know what, what the, the right way to describe it is to, to think that you can get all these things without new fundamental science. Right. There's an impatience yeah. about it that I think is actually in a lot of cases going to make it take longer. Um, and and it's sort of driven by a, a select number of cases where uh, there have been uh, successes in, in a short amount of time, but that that's a small number of cases, right? Um, I think you need to have some long term investment as well <laughs> if you want things to yeah. to happen down the road. So I think there's a place for both, and and you know I. I you know, I don't know. I don't know NIH that well. I mean, maybe NIH is really investing in more fundamental things that I don't know about, and it's just not my area. So I don't want to say mm -hmm. that they aren't. But, but in general, my sense is there is a much, um, there is a much larger um, impetus to argue for direct applications of what you're doing if you want to get money for it, and and uh, yeah. and a lot of. A lot, a lot of people I talk to, you know, you can tell that they put they put that in their grant, and they know they're never gonna 
actually get all the way to that application, but it's in the grant, right? Yeah. And I don't, I don't yeah. feel comfortable doing that, <laughs> you know. So I, I don't like a system that that encourages me to do that. Right. And yeah, but, I, I just yeah, I don't. That's, anyway. I don't. How do you think? How do you think we get to this point though? Like, because I, I, I think it falls back to like you just have really good professors that, like, by nature are really intuitive and so they're always raising the bar and so it's like i feel like that just progressed into the to the system we have now i don't know if you agree or disagree but i don't know how to revert it though either i don't, I don't know um yeah yeah i don't know how to I, get I back know. to form. i mean you know i i review a, yeah i review a lot of papers um and one of my most common critiques on a paper is i'll write something like yeah this paper is great Please remove all of this overselling. <laughs> it does not need it. Yeah. It's already great, right? So you don't need those two sentences at the end that that claim that this is gonna, you know, cure this disease. It's clearly it's clearly twenty three steps away from that, right? This is not mm-hmm. a new paradigm in anything, right? You're, you're so when when a so one thing I've, you know, I, I it's hard for me to know, uh, and I'm a little scared to look back at my early papers to see if I've done this very much. But but I'm really sensitive now, especially in my own papers, to, um, to putting qualitative value judgments on my own work. Like I I I don't want, I, you know, like in my own papers, I don't I don't if my students write a draft and they say like interestingly, like I remove it, <laughs> like. Like, well, it might be interesting to us, but it's up to the reader to decide how interesting it is. And and that's a minor yeah. one, you know, once in a while I let that that's like through, right? But I feel like it's not my place to tell the reader how how interesting or important or, mm. or cool this is, right? I, I should point out the possible connections to things, but yeah, it's almost like if I, I in fact I'll say this in reviews, like if if the paper keeps telling me how awesome the paper is, that makes me think the paper is less awesome, <laughs> because the, mm. it shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to shout about how awesome it is. That should stand on its own, right? So you should point out why it's important. You know how it's connected to these things. But when you start uh, saying using the words that you know, I, like somewhere I have it on my computer, there I found a title once that actually like described a method as stupendous in the title <laughs> like that was the pinnacle of, of of this that i saw right i'm like a stupendous yeah. method i'm like wow, my head almost exploded right <laughs> you know so there's there's a gray area of course but but i'm i'm really sensitive about about some judgments i think are should be left to the consumers of our work um yeah and you know and it's you shouldn't I feel like if you try to f- force a judgment on the reader, then then that's not right. And me as a reader, I, I, I get offended when someone tries to tell me what my opinion of the of a work should be. So yeah, I, I also I feel you like you know the... now that I'm just recently turned fifty, and I feel like I'm turning into a grumpy old man as well. So <laughs> who knows? <laughs> no, I I, uh, I I I hear you. I mean, listen, I've only I've only been kind of. I'm only a third year graduate student, so like, you know, what the hell do I know? But in my two years of doing this so far, like, I can, I can already like see myself seeing through the, let's say, the fat of like what people write in their papers, or it's just like, you know, and kind of, I'm already starting to see through it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I don't like the fact that it's like become accepted that we all know that it's, yeah, it's it's just decoration that we just ignore. I mean, why why did, why is it even right. there if that's the case, right? I have a pet peeve I, I have a pet peeve that I don't know that maybe you can speak to a little bit is like how like um listen, I don't know people personally at, at like publications or like papers. Let's like I don't know people personally at these journals. But whatever happened to like a two-page like let's say Jack's Coms where they just told you exactly what they did and like that was it. And now you have yeah. comms papers that are like literally 11 pages long and it's like, dude, like just show me what you did. And it's like they have a – for some reason they have a computational study for like some reason that they – I don't know why they did that. It's like they don't need they don't need to put that – unless you're going to do a full article, then sure. But 
I don't know. This kind of goes back to yeah, his yeah. raising the bar. Where I have like, yeah. like, oh man. Yeah, I have a few things to say about that. So, so I I was a journal editor for a while. I I was a, an editor at ACS Omega for a while, which is an interesting journal. Um, uh, so Jack's communications, it's interesting. Um, you know, they were two page communications for a while, and it was a, it was quite a struggle to to get things down to two pages. But it, I feel like it was worthwhile. And then and then, the it there was like three pages, but. Now I don't even know if there's a limit. It, so in that in that case, yeah. I don't, you know, you know. So now I th I think I, I mean I don't know exactly, but I think the distinction between a communication and an art and an article is that a communication is supposed to be urgent, um, and yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I think the line is very much blurred, right? So it's sort of like chemical science, like makes no distinctions. Like every article is an edge article. It can be whatever length you want. Right. And it's kind of becoming yeah. like that. Um, yeah. And, and in some fields, it, it, it matters. Like in synthetic organic chemistry, I feel like my synthetic friends like to brag if they got a Jax communication rather than a Jax full paper. Right. But in other fields, a Jax paper is a Jax paper. So what, you know, yeah, whatever that. Yeah. Is. Um, but regarding computational stuff, there are some people who feel like, um, and, and I've been approached by people who want to collaborate who feel like, well, if I just have this, can you just do a computational study on this reaction? Because I feel like then I can send it to one notch up in the journal hierarchy. And I'm like, well, no. so first of all, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and second of all, it's kind of offensive that you asked me that. <laughs> right. right. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, there has to be a point. There has to be, a, you know, if, if, if the mechanism is obvious and there's no question for the calculations to solve, then why would I be interested in using my resources to do calculations, right? Yeah. There has to be an interesting yeah. question for, for me to be involved, right? I mean, what, mm -hmm. there's nothing for me to be curious about. Why should, why should I spend the time? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not, I'm not running a business where I just provide a service for you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that it's, you know, if I'm going to collaborate with someone, they they have to convince me that it that it's interesting enough, and there has to be something where yeah. if the if the answer is obvious to me, then I'm not gonna be interested enough, right? Like they they have to pose a question, and I have to not know the answer. And so so mm -hmm. you, you know if I agree to collaborate with someone, the first thing I always ask them to do is, uh, you know, could you give me a list of the questions that you want answered in order of priority for you? And then I'll get back to you and and tell you the order of priority for me, and also the order, you know, the feasibility of each one. Because <laughs> there's yeah, often right. a disconnect. Often the things that seem easiest from the experimental side are, are can be the most complicated things to actually get a computational answer to. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I don't I don't like to be involved in in those kind of things. Um, you know, once in a while we are, or it doesn't seem like it's going to go that way, and it be, and then after you agreed to help someone, and you realize that that really that's all they want, and like because you get back to somebody like, well, it's far more complicated than we thought it was going to be, and it's really interesting, and they're just like, well, we need to submit the paper, and I'm like, well, you can submit it without us if you want, but but we want you know we want to get yeah. to the bottom of it, right? Um, so that's more interesting. So, or, or, but sometimes, yeah. sometimes that's fine. And, and then we like, okay, well, well, let's, let's do a separate follow up paper on this interesting mechanistic thing. And maybe we can put a little bit of it in this paper if you want. Um, and then follow up with a different mechanistic study. And, and sometimes that becomes a great collaboration. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways of doing things. But I, I don't, I don't like, um, I don't like to read experimental papers where I feel like they just threw, threw in a computational section. And it doesn't add anything to the story, you know. That there has to be a reason. So, and I'm a computational person, right? I mean, that, that if it doesn't add anything, you know, if you if you did it, fine. You can put in the supporting information, though. <laughs> but, so right. I, I really, uh, my my group is semi famous for having gigantic supporting information file. <laughs> so <laughs> we do lots of stuff. But my policy is the the paper has to be a story, right? And so if it's Right. If it's not part of the story, it it's it, it it's got to go in a footnote or in the supporting information. 
Um, so for yeah. years, you know, back when good rule. back when Orglet had 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 the notes on the pages instead of at the end, um, I had a goal of of having a full column of of notes. <laughs> And I was close. I got like a, a few lines of text, and then the whole column was almost all notes. But I never quite got a full column of notes because, like, there's so many interesting things to say about a lot of the parts of the project that just don't fit in the flow of the story, right? So I don't think you should right. leave them out. Um, but if they're not in the flow of the story, they don't have to be in the flow of the story. And there are other ways right. to include that information. So everyone has their own different opinion on how things should be presented, of course, and and. Everyone should have their own style, but for for me, my policy is every paper has a story, and and my general policy is one paper, one story. So I, I'm not in the business of trying to get as many papers as possible. It's sort of one paper, one story. If we if we start to write a paper, and 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 we're working on it, we're like, man, there's there are two stories here. Then we split it in two, right? Um, yeah. But if it's if it's one really long if it's one really long story, then we leave it as one really long story. We don't cut it into. So that's yeah. That's, that's my good way approach. to be. Yeah, I, it's simple but effective, and I think that's I think it's a good way to be. I think um, a lot of people actually don't even realize, you know, from uh, I can, at least I can speak in, within the chemistry. Like certainly, like you need to be a good storyteller, good writer. I think I, I'm some I'm really starting to appreciate now um, as I begin to. Uh, begin to write my papers mm -hmm. one day as I've really taken that to heart. It's like, okay, what is actually important here? What is the story to tell? And then kind of go from there. Um, so yeah, sometimes people ask me how I spend my day and the activity I spend the most time on is writing. Yeah. That's, that's whether writing grants, writing, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> writing, uh, papers. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, if I'm going to write a recommendation letter for you, you want me to be a good writer, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I mean, writing, right? I mean, writing is hard, um, and you know, especially hard if English is not your first language. Um, there's so yeah. many challenges in, uh, in writing, um, but you know, smoothing smoothing over text is different than clarity of thought, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, you, what you have to get good at is is organizing your thoughts in a in a logical way, um, and so there's a flow to the logic and a flow to the story. Um, I, I wouldn't fixate so much, especially at the beginning, on on you know fancy words or you know make making it sound flowery or anything like that. Right. The most important part is is the logic, the flow of the logic, uh, and the the, you know, the story has to have a, a reasonable flow so readers can follow it. And you can always pretty it up later. Yeah. So I'm always yeah. telling my students that don't don't fix it on the words. Just get it down on the paper because you're going to send it to me. and I'm going to change the words anyway. <laughs> right? right. So, you know, but but if if you send it to me and I can't understand the the logic of the science, then how is a reader going to do that? But if 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 I understand right. exactly the point, you know, arguments and the flow of what's going on and then we have something to work with, right right i hear you there yeah so uh is there a, moving into i'm gonna kind of circle back to kind of like your your research now because uh mm -hmm. definitely want to talk about that a little bit and uh i guess i can kind of give you the floor here a little bit and because i well i know you work on a lot of uh, a lot of things but i know you know a lot of your your research is uh revolved uh, you know, doing understanding carbocation cyclizations and rearrangements, um, but there there are a few other things. I kind of want to just let you take the floor here a little bit about you know the things that you work on in your lab. Yeah, so um, I kind of suffer for the from the same problem as as Hulk. I think that uh, I'm interested in a lot of things. <laughs> so um, yep, yep. We 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 work on. Um, you know, weird organic molecules. We work on synthetic organic reactions, organometallic reactions. Um, I love carbocations, and we look at some classic ones and, and a lot of carbocation rearrangements that happen in natural products biosynthesis. Um, we uh, uh, we still do some NMR computations to help assign natural product structures. Um, mm -hmm. 
lately we are into photochemistry. Um, but the kind of overarching themes of that, of what we do, a lot of it is driven by what I mentioned earlier, which is uh, understanding selectivity, specifically kinetic selectivity for reactions, where that selectivity um, comes from unusual places. So, and often that is uh, from a non-statistical dynamic effect. Uh, so like mm -hmm. a reaction with a bifurcation, which we're still looking at a bunch of reactions with bifurcations. Um, my interest in photochemistry came out of that. So if you think of what we said before about a reaction with a bifurcation, there's a transition state and you fall down a hill. And if you're careful, you hit, you'll hit a second transition state that interconverts two products. Well, if you think of a photochemical reaction, you know, you excite from the ground state to an excited state, and then you fall down the excited state surface until you hit a point where you cross back to the ground state, right? If that point mm. where you cross back to the ground state is, is near a transition state on the ground state that leads to two different products, it's very much like a bifurcation, um, except that you came from an excited state. Now you have to worry about getting the electronics right on the excited state and dealing with what happens when you cross from the excited state to the ground state. But there's an analogy there. Um, and uh, so I want to understand that. So that's kind of how we get into photochemistry and understanding how momentum works on the excited state and, and when it when you go from an excited state to a ground state. So that's kind of my interest mm -hmm. in photochemistry. And we're looking at that potentially for synthetic reactions, but also biosynthetic reactions. Um, so an overarching theme is is sort of momentum and um, or my my four and a half year old. Uh, the other day we were at a playground and she was having me push her and she said, Daddy, give me more momentum, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, and, and so yeah, full circle. We're uh, full circle moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's one kind of overarching theme. Um, uh, understanding that, uh, and the other thing that uh, is really on my mind that I don't fully grasp is entropy. So I'm really interested in, mm. and I don't yet know how best to tackle it. Uh, organic reactions where you do have two competing uh, transition states. But you know, say from experiment or calculation, but there's a good number of examples from experiment where the selectivity comes from not differences in the enthalpies of those two competing transition states, but instead from the entropies. Um, and looking at the structures, it's not obvious. Like this one is, you know, just floppier than that one, which is how we usually think about mm -hmm. entropy. I want to be more quantitative. And and um, try so I'm trying to understand kinetic selectivity that comes from entropy differences and trying to get that from uh, dynamic simulations. Uh, and always the goal is the same to try to get to the point where we understand things well enough such that I can um, you know tell a synthetic chemist how to you know how to pre predict what's going on without having to do a hardcore calculation. Right, so basically the goal is to, to mm. put myself out of business, um, and which is fine because I'll just go on to the next business. Right? That that's kind of the right. ultimate goal uh, to to create a model that what uh, Roald would say is portable. Right, it's useful for other systems, qualitative or semi-quantitative, um, but that people can apply without having to do the the really elaborate calculations that we we often do, and that's actually a a strength of Roll and Ken, Ken Houck. Um, you know, they were developing really meaningful, useful models of reactivity um, before you could do any calculation that was at all respectable, <laughs> right? And those models right. have stood the test of time. And, and, and so I, that influence has really rubbed off on me as kind of my goal. I have, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who wants to predict an enantioselectivity right um, because it's a tiny amount of kilocalories per mole that you're usually talking about. I would, I would like to be able to tell you this product and not that one, or if you change this, maybe it'll go up, but that's, and this, and I'd rather tell you why, <laughs> right. Um, right. Then it'll go up by 2% because that's in the error bars of the calculations. And to get that right, you know, we can't even afford to do the calculations that would really get that right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So en entropy, dynamic effects, momentum effects, uh, and the, on the those on applied just, to photochemistry. Uh, those quick, are kind of uh, things, yeah. 
on on like the entropy um are you envisioning like there's certain like numbers and metrics that you could pull let's say from i don't know a transition state like that would guide your thinking is that like kind mm -hmm. of what like there would be sort of metrics like that uh, yeah well uh, yeah i'll give you a couple examples so um one thing that took me a long time to realize and actually it was a surprisingly friendly reviewer rejecting my paper who helped me with this <laughs> is that when we're, <laughs> we're doing dynamic simulations and uh you know if you think about going over a transition state right at the transition state there are walls on either side of you so you're so perpendicular to the the reaction coordinate there you could think of an energy well right um mm -hmm. so because it's a saddle right you're going through the lowest point um but you can also think about the width of that saddle, right? Is it a really skinny saddle? So it's like a really skinny mountain pass or is it really wide and broad? Okay. Um, and if it's really skinny, then there aren't many ways to get through it. But if it's really wide, then there are a lot of different ways to get through it. Well, that's a measure of entropy, mm. right? If there are a lot of different ways to get through that transition state region, then the entropy is much better, right? Um, but if it's really skinny, then there aren't a lot of ways to get through it, aren't a lot of paths through it, so the entropy is much worse. So that's one thing we're thinking about, that we bumped into this in a couple of cases, um, where uh, the shape of the potential energy surface, orthogonal to the reaction coordinate, where we don't usually think about that, is, is a, a marker of entropy associated with transition states. And you can see that in, in dynamics. So sometimes, uh, if, the, if that, uh, if the width of that uh, pathway at the transition state is really thin, it's hard for trajectories sometimes to, to hit it. They keep missing it. <laughs> they bounce off the walls mm -hmm. and they turn around and they go back <laughs> and they don't make it over the transition state. So they, so that's, that's an important contributor in some cases. So that's one thing. Um, another, another thing that we're thinking about is, is we have a, a system that we've looked at in collaboration with Daniel Romo um, where we know that the selectivity is entropy controlled and we have the transition states. And my best guess at what is going on is that there are these two aromatic systems that are stacking on each other. And as far as I can tell, the surface area of the stacking is different in the two competing transition state structures. And I think mm. that that is leading to the difference in entropy because, you know, the, the pi systems, you can think of them as they're sticky, right? So there's a pi pi stacking interaction between them, right? And so that stickiness is uh, is affecting how quickly they can move past each other as the reaction goes forward, um, and that and that is, a, is is related to the entropy also, right? Um, and so, but how to quantify that is is constantly bugs me every time I think about it. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about quantifying that by looking at at yeah as as uh, as looking for that in trajectories of. But unfortunately, that system is big and expensive to run trajectories on. But we're looking at smaller models of that kind of thing. So yeah. we think of that as as a as drag. You know, there when there's a good interaction that a good any good interaction that you that forms and then you have to lose will slow down a trajectory, right? Mm. Um, because you're you're because a good interaction enthalpically is sticky, <laughs> right? Right. And that's but but it, because it's sticky, it's gonna it's gonna slow down um, uh, atoms that are trying to move past that good interaction. So that's that's right. another effect that we're thinking about. So those those are the kind of we, things that um, we're kicking around these days. We probably should have done this first, but we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it now. Is mm. we probably should define entropy in terms of chemistry. Like what we probably uh, should have done that first. Sure. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so uh, okay, so if you want to anger a physical chemist, you'll say that entropy is disorder. Okay, um, what you should say is is something like entropy is the number of available microstates. Uh, so let me give you an analogy. Um, what what you know people like to say that they like to use the analogy of a messy room, right? They'll yeah. say like. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, a messy room is, is, is a, is a good example of entropy because look how messy it is, right? Uh, it's very disordered. Um, but what you really should be saying is, well, okay. Um, if you have a room that's 
perfectly clean. There's only one way to be mm. perfectly clean, right? But there are a lot of ways to be messy. <laughs> yeah, that's entropy, right? There's a there's a lot of different messy microstates, and only one clean microstate, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, so en entropy is really how many options do you have to do something. So I'm talking about um, the width at the transition state. I'm saying if there's if there's a lot of ways to to get past the transition state because it's wide, then then there are a lot of ways to do that. That's entropically good. If there's only one way to do it, that's entropically yeah. bad. No matter what the enthalpy is, right? Yeah. So it's really how many options yeah. do you have? So something, you know, organic chemists think about a molecule that's conformationally flexible is entropically good. Well, a physical chemist would describe that as there are a lot of different conformational states accessible to that molecule, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's that makes sense. about entropy. Yeah, that's good. I'll definition point out there. also that I'm really I'm really an organic chemist at heart, and and despite my best efforts over the years, I've been pulled more and more towards speak chem, <laughs> and and it's <laughs> it's really because I've I've want, the problems I wanted to tackle in in organic chemistry have necessitated uh, me learning more and more speak chem. Um, and I, I feel like yeah. I've been lucky in my department anyway. That the physical computational person people have been uh, very supportive of me, you know, knowing that I'm coming from the organic side of things. So, yeah, actually, yeah, I, I uh, the appreciate. It's it's funny how people kind of like I never really appreciated like PCM until like it's like all of a sudden now I'm talking about computational chemistry. It's like oh god, now I I really wish I kind yeah. of took that more seriously as an undergrad or whatever, but it, I feel like PCAM, I describe it as like, it, it, like it really does age like a fine wine. Like I really, like you really have to appreciate it. And like it, as time moves on, like you really begin to, um, to appreciate it for what it is. Um, but well, honestly, as we, uh, you know, I think kind part, of, part of the, part of the problem, uh, let me just vent about this for a minute is that sure. you know, when I took PCAM as an undergrad, I don't remember anyone anyone ever telling me that it was relevant to the organic chemistry that I love. <laughs> if someone had told mm. me that, <laughs> then may maybe I, I would have started to appreciate it earlier. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I, it's a, uh, it's, it's tough because it's so like mathy based. So it's like, I don't know how it, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how you could like reconfigure the PCAM course to be a little bit more, Mm. applicably friendly, I guess. I don't know how you describe it, but it's it's tough, tough job. Call ask. Well, I, I do think you know just just for example, if you you know when you're talking about you know entropy, if you started talking about conformations of small organic molecules as an example, you know mm. I think suddenly the organic people might might perk up a little bit, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. So uh, sometimes that's it gets a, too bogged down too. in the math. But there are other people who who don't want to hear about that. They just want to hear about the math. So it's always, you know, it's, yeah. it's always a challenge to appeal to everyone. Can't so. please everyone. Can't please everyone. What are you going to do? Yep. Um, as we begin to wrap up here, there's a couple uh, of uh, – mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. One is your interest in uh, flash fiction and poetry because I, I saw on your website you, you kind of mm -hmm. do that. And so what – first of all, um, I know it's – the brief study up I did on it, it's like kind of like a they're sh they're short fiction. It's like less than I don't know. It's like less than like I don't know sixty words or something like that. I don't know. I don't know exactly, but I'm kind of interested yeah, in varies. to hear like yeah, like I'm I'm more so interested about your interest in it. Like how did you become interested in that? Because um, it's not often I guess that a chemistry professor actually does this. Right, actually has hobbies outside of chemistry. Believe it or not, guys, like they do. Um, so, I kind of want to hear you know, how you, your initial interest in that. Yeah. So, um, so flash fiction has a there. There are numerous definitions. You know, some people would consider it up to like like ten thousand words or a thousand words, or some people have micro fiction, nano fiction. There's all these different words, but um, most of the things I write are you know, a couple hundred to uh, a thousand words in that range. Um, and it's, uh, it's mostly just when I get an idea in my head and I feel like I, I just want to express it somehow. And so I just start writing and then, um, yeah, I kind of like playing with words a little bit. 
and I, and I do that in my chemistry papers too. Um, there are a few things I've snuck into my papers over the years that I won't tell you about, <laughs> but uh, um, you might encounter I'll them. I'll find it for myself. Um, but yeah, um, but uh, yeah, and it's you know, I, I mean, I also do ke chemistry writing. That's um, you know, some people are against writing reviews, for example, and, and I like to write reviews. It's an opportunity to synthesize things and, and put them together into a bigger story. And I've done some writing for uh, American Scientist, which is sort of a more popular writing, which is actually the hardest writing I've ever done about chemistry. Um, <laughs> but for fiction things, it's really just, just for fun. And uh, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. It just kind of... Uh, it's a it's a it's a different way to express myself. Yeah. 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 I'll and leave it up to uh, yeah, people can go see. So, yeah, so sometimes I you know sometimes I get something in my head and I feel like I yeah, I have to take this afternoon to, to try to write it. And and I write short things because I don't have the patience for writing really long things. A full <laughs> like novel. so for me so you know yeah, I mean, I, I send uh, I send these things. Out. I think because I'm an academic, I feel like I have to send them somewhere and get and get rejected, uh, <laughs> which yeah, is, yeah. is what we do. Um, but uh, you know, I um, often often the things I send, I think get rejected because they don't they don't have that much of a plot. Everyone wants a plot. And like I'm kind of against plots. <laughs> I feel like I have an idea, and I kind of want to write you that, that gets the yeah that gets the idea across. But I don't have the patience to write a plot. <laughs> so right. that's just me. <laughs> so anyway, that's so if I could write a plot, then I I could probably write a novel. But I it's not you know I don't it's not my yeah. Thing. The other the other it was funny though because i was like looking through like your flash fiction and one of them was titled bifurcation i was like that's so funny <laughs> like <laughs> well, that's the first one i ever wrote um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i thought that was i thought that was really funny um but the other thing i actually wanted to uh the last thing i actually want to talk to you about was your um your teaching chemistry for disability so you teach computational chemistry for blind mm -hmm. people and so I thought that was really fascinating. I was like, because I've, you know, obviously, like, I would have never thought of that. I would have never even thought that would be even possible. So I'm wondering if you could uh, break it down a little bit of how, you know, your how or why you're, one, you were doing that. And two, like, what are the, how do you physically do that? Like, what are the, mm -hmm. some of the steps to go into, like, doing that? Yeah. Yeah, so that uh, all really started when uh, a Davis undergrad named Hobie Wedler um, came to me. So he had first talked to my colleague, uh, Jared Shaw, who is a synthetic organic chemist, um, about, you know, wanting to pursue, uh, chemistry research. And, um, y you know, it's, it's hard to imagine doing synthetic organic chemistry when you can't see, right. And in his, his lab classes, mm. he always had to have an assistant. Um, uh, but Jared suggested that, uh, maybe he speak to me as a, because as a computational chemist, maybe there was something we could do together. And Jared had this idea that, you know, maybe maybe uh, you and Dean could come up with this robot that if you calculate a structure would take take these balls and sticks and put them together into your computed structure. Um, uh, and then Hobie came to talk to me and I said, well, let's just get a 3D printer. <laughs> and so that's what we did. Yeah. So, uh, so Hobie joined my group as an undergrad. Um, and then we worked on ways to uh, 3D print models of the structures that he calculated. Um, and, and he stayed on as a grad student and got his PhD with me. So it very much came from him. So we're able to pr uh, 3D print computed structures just from the coordinates you get in an output file. And we can print them with different textures on the atoms for uh, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. It turns out he doesn't need that um, because you can just tell from the connectivity. Um, also, we can print like uh, uh, computed bond lengths on uh, on the sticks in the bond stick model as Braille, so you can read the bond lengths. And we've thought about other things, and but then Hobie graduated, um, so those were the kind of things we were thinking about. I also learned about uh, the resolution of Hobie's fingers, like how big the balls and sticks needed to be. <laughs> Um, mm. So that we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, so that was kind of an, an output problem, right? Uh, input is a different problem. 
Uh, so Holby also, you know, took my class and he took a lot of classes in the chemistry department. And uh, so he had come up with a very uh, simple input solution for a chemistry class. So, you know, he would have an assistant with him. And um, if someone drew a structure on the board, all he would do is he would he'd take like, you know, just like a regular like legal legal pad and then a piece of like printer paper, thick printer paper. And uh, his assistant would draw the molecule as big as possible on that printer paper um, and then uh, flip it over and then take like a ballpoint pen and trace it on the backside um, so that when you turn it back, it's raised. And then he could read the line drawing with his fingers. And so he would very mm. quickly be able to get structures that were drawn on the board. And when people didn't know this was happening, he used to love that. He would... He would like, well, what about that? They knew he was blind, but they didn't know he was getting the molecule so quickly. So he'd ask a question about that, you know, that uh, ketone on the left of the molecule. And they had no idea how he knew. Um, so simple things like that. But, but uh, you know, having him in a class, I think, made, made me a better teacher. And my other colleagues would say the same thing. Because you, you're more precise with your language. Um, you don't just say that ketone over there, you're more explicit. And I think all the other students benefited from, from that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, for Hobie's PhD, it was a mix of him doing, um, uh, you know, uh, regular computational organic chemistry projects with some of these tools um, that we were working on and then also um, developing these kind of tools. Um, and so, we did that, and then uh, we also worked on um, a camp that uh, Hobie created uh, for um, uh, blind and visually impaired teenagers, a science camp. So we did that for a while. Um, we uh, Hobie started a nonprofit. I was on the board of directors for that. That uh, doesn't exist at the, anymore, but uh, Hobie's gone off now to be a... Um, a business person he has you can google him hobiewedler.com and see what he's up to um but since then i'm currently on uh the acs's uh committee for chemists with disabilities so i'm working with acs um in that regard uh so it's a, a general interest of mine in um trying to uh further chemistry education for for people not just uh uh blind chemists but um, I feel like the, you know, it, given all the attention that um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, has received in recent years, uh, often uh, people with disabilities are kind of left out of that discussion. So it's kind yeah. of a personal mission of mine to ensure that uh, they're not. Yeah, so that's one, one of the things that I'm uh, very passionate about these days. Yeah, that's really that's really fascinating because, I mean, I've, I, I mean, I've certainly like haven't even thought about let's say STEM for people with like physical disabilities for sure, like blindness, whether they like, are hearing impaired mm -hmm. or um, even p students, let's say mm -hmm. like you know cerebral palsy or something like that, where it's like they're mentally there but they can't like yeah. they don't have the, the motor skills. So that's really fascinating because I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we really. I could sp I'll speak for myself. I definitely take it for granted, like my motor capabilities and like f yeah. sight and hearing. Um, and you know, I, yeah, the I'll fact that I would be able to things like, one thing go ahead, go ahead. Go oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say like the, um, to think that I couldn't do like chemistry, benchtop chemistry, computational chemistry, um, it's a scary thought. It's like, and I have to take for granted or, you know, I can't, um, I can't take for granted like the ability to have these motor skills uh, for sure. And, you know, hearing and mm -hmm. uh, sight and stuff like that. So I definitely, uh, so I thought that yeah, was really so, cool that so one, um, you did that. One thing I learned from Hobie, uh, for example, is that, you know, in my physical organic class, we do a little bit about symmetry and, and, and students learn how to assign point groups. So I don't know if you ever uh, did point mm. groups, maybe in an inorganic class. Um, but you know, we don't do character tables, but we assign point groups. And so, um, yeah. Which requires manipulating molecules in 3D in your head. Uh, and what I learned from Hobie is he's really good at that. The problem for him is not 3D spatial reasoning or manipulating molecules in his head. It's just the input problem of getting the molecules into his brain. <laughs> um, and so that made it really clear to me the uh, that there's a distinct difference between uh, vision and, and visualization. Um, 
And mm. I think that, uh, you know, sometimes we jump to conclusions that are wrong and we have assumptions that are wrong, that those two things must be connected, but they're clearly not. I mean, Hobie has been blind since birth, but he is great at assigning point groups, for example, if he can just get the, the shape in his head. Um, so those are the kind of things that have right. really helped me to, um, you know, change the way I, I think about uh, people and question a lot of my assumptions. Yeah, that's really, that's really fascinating. I actually just went to his website now. I'm going to read up on, on the Hobie now. Um, <laughs> so uh, with that being said, though, uh, Prof uh, Professor Tentil, I want to thank you so much for your time and consideration here. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, today. And, uh, you know, I look forward to, you know, future publications and hopefully you're able to figure out that entropy problem. Cause I think that'll be definitely a revolutionary, uh, game changer, I guess, let's say in computational chemistry and how we think about transition states, potential energy services and all that, all that. So thank you again. And, uh, I want to, uh, thanks so much. Say thank you to the viewers that are listening and, uh, you know, we'll see you on the next episode. Alrighty guys. Alrighty.